So I uh, just want to say thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in your Detroit STARS conference again this year. I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the larger story of African-American women in baseball, not just with the uh, Negro Leagues, but before and after, and not just as players, but in a variety of different roles. The story is a much bigger one than most of us are aware of. We generally think about um, Ethel Manley, Tony Stone, names that are a little more familiar to some of us, but that is just uh, the beginning of the story. And so where we usually start when we talk about Black women in baseball is with the Dolly Vardens, who are a team playing in 1883 in the Philadelphia area. In fact, there were two Dolly Varden teams, simply referred to as the Dolly Varden Ones and the Dolly Varden Twos. This is a new book coming out this fall, first thing ever written about the Dolly Vardens, uh, based on minimal newspaper coverage, but what little there is tended to focus on the outfits that the teams wore. And you can see that portrayed here in the picture with the red and white cap, the, long, the red dress, the blue sleeves, the stockings. There was a lot of emphasis, not surprisingly, um, as was often the case describing women ball ballplayers um, of any uh, white or colored, white or black. Um, in terms of that idea, talking about how they dressed, what they looked like, much more so than their baseball playing. Um, one game that was described between the Dolly Varden number ones and another women's team in the Philadelphia area called the Captain Jinx described the game focusing mostly on the follies, I guess you could say, um, a girl getting uh, the shortstop. Philomena Morris getting hit in the face with a ball and breaking her nose, an outfielder getting stung by a bee and sitting down in the middle of outfield and crying for delaying the game for 15 minutes. These are the things that are described. And then they finally get to the actual scores and the final score of the game as reported um, we'll tell you something again about the level of play, was 67 to 67. It was called a tie by a at least reported in the papers, female umpire, colored umpire, as he, she was described in the paper, um, by the name of Jenny Pepper. Um, and she was the lone umpire for the game. Um, and so a series of follies seemed to follow Ella Harris, captain of the Dolly Varden Ones, and Fanny Watts, captain of the Captain Jinx team. And so this is really where we begin the documented discussion of African-American women in baseball. Throughout the latter part of the 1800s, there are sporadic mentions of teams appearing mostly um, in Midwestern cities, in Kansas, in Illinois, a um, couple in Ohio, okay? But that's, they're very sporadic as lots of mentions of women's baseball tend to be. And when they are mentioned, very little detail given, uh, names often left out or sometimes just a miss or a missus kind of idea. So it makes it very hard to track these women down. Um, but this book will help to shed a light on at least the Dolly Vardens and this early beginning. Where we pick up the story um, is as we move into the early 1900s. And again, sporadic mentions of variety of teams playing, traveling a little bit, playing both um, reds and whites, women's teams and bloomer girl teams. Um, there is a mention in 1908 in Springfield um, of a Mrs. Brooker who attempts, at least according to the paper, that they wanted to start uh, what they called a colored women's league. Um, unfortunately, no mentions have been found to follow to determine if they were ever successful um, in that effort. Um, but in 1910, 1911 timeframe, we see increased coverage of the St. Louis Black Bronco Baseball Club, pictured here. Um, and you can see that they're advertising as the only colored female baseball club in the world today. 
may or may not be inaccurate, but that was a very common kind of thing. Um, women's baseball teams often portrayed themselves that way as the only women's baseball team, um, the only women pitcher, the only uh, female player, those kinds of things. You'll notice the bloomer costume and another more typical idea with um, white and black teams at the time uh, where there would often be male players on the team. And so you can see them pictured here. The typical idea was the men would um, often be the pitcher and the catcher. Um, based on the existing idea that those were the most difficult or most important positions and so they should go to the men. Um, we don't have a lot of details on the St. Louis Black Broncos, but Articles have been discovered, indicate a few teams that they played. The Nashville Giants, they lost by a score of two to one. They lost to a Columbia Cubs team by a score of five to three. So it would appear that unlike a 67 to 67 score for the Dolly Vardens, that we're talking about a team um, with some skill and opportunities to practice and things like that. Cause that was often the other reason for some of the, they were maybe brought together um, lots of articles about teams brought together for a benefit for a church and things like that. And so not really having much chance to practice would account for some of the scores, lack of equipment, um, lack of instruction uh, would be also an issue. I put up the picture on the team on the uh, right-hand side um, simply to illustrate that this is not the Dolly Vardens. If you do a lot of research, this picture often appears in discussions of the Dolly Vardens, but it's actually a early 1920s YWCA baseball team. Um, YWCA has provided lots of opportunities for women to participate in a variety of activities and sports, not just baseball. But this picture is often misidentified um, as that Dolly Varden team. But you can see by the attire and particularly the gloves that this would not be an 1883 team. Um, and so just to identify that. Um, as we sort of think moving forward. So the St. Louis Black Broncos are playing in the 19 teens. As you move into the uh, 1920s and 1930s, the discussion of black women's teams increases. There are teams mentioned in uh, Camden, New Jersey, in Kiwanaway, in South Central LA, where there appears to have been uh, the potential creation of a local league dominated by a team called the East Side Girls, teams in Bristol, Connecticut. Um, and then one that got a significant amount of mention in the Baltimore area were the Baltimore Black Sox Bloomer Girls. Um, in one game, they played the very famous New York Bloomers, the New York Bloomer Girls we often associate with Maude Nelson. Um, Unfortunately, the Baltimore team lost to the New York Bloomers by a score of 48 to two. They played a local men's team called the Excelsior Sparrows on a number of different occasions, losing by scores of 17 to 14, tied a game 29 to 29, and then finally beat them in a game 32 to 31. Um, and again, those scores are not what we would typically expect to see, so they tell you something about the level of play. Um, but a fair number of articles about the uh, Baltimore Black Sox Bloomers. Another team that we see a fair amount of mention is a team called the Nelson Colored Bloomer Girls out of uh, New Jersey, playing in 1932 and 1933. John Nelson, reason for the name. Um, the team seems to have been led by their pitcher, Hannah Marbury who gets uh, a lot of individual mention in both um, games and just in general as somebody with a great skill level who um, they talk about her as a pitcher with some control, um, ability to direct the rest of her teammates. And she appears to have had a pretty good bat as well because in a couple of um, short descriptions of games, she is listed as getting a couple of hits while she is also pitching, driving in the winning run in a game. And so Hannah Marbury certainly is one who gets some individual mention um, as we think about players and teams. Um, as we continue to think about players and teams, I would also mention um, that we're going to come back to our three that we most commonly think of in terms of the 1950s with Connie, Tony, and Mamie. Um, but we can also look at the question of ownership 
and the women who participated in as officials, particularly in the Negro Leagues themselves. Um, the first that we normally think of, of course, is Effa Manley, who owned the, the Newark Eagles with her husband, Abe, from 1936 till when she sold the team in 1948 and then left the New Jersey area to move out west. Um, Effa, of course, known both for her contributions with the baseball team and with the league, but also for her civic engagement, for the things that she did to make the community better, to ensure that the position she held and the position that she believed the Eagles held in the Newark community, which particularly in the late 30s coming out of the Great Depression, um, was a community like many others that, that suffered. And so she wanted to improve as best she could. So getting involved in campaigns um, like the don't work where you can't buy, holding anti-lynching days at the ballpark, holding benefit games during World War II, um, and ensuring that her team always understood that she wanted them out in the community um, in their best dress and in their best behavior so that they represented the team well. To give people something to look up to, role models was um, would be the way to think about it, right? To, something to aspire to, something to be proud of. And then, of course, we also know that Effa is the one who pushes and pushes back when Branch Rickey and the other major league owners come looking for players. And she says, you can't have my players unless you pay me. And she ultimately is going to be successful in that effort. Um, whereas Jackie Robinson, of course, no payment was received. And um, Ethel believed that if you were going to pay major league teams, then you needed to pay the Negro League teams. They were, she wanted that recognition and is ultimately going to push for that idea. Um, on the opposing side, um, you can't talk about owners without talking about a little bit about Minnie Forbes. Uh, Minnie Forbes, of course, um, we associate with the Detroit Stars, um, being named the manager, uh, the owner of the Detroit Stars, sorry, in 1956, receiving um, this from her uncle, Ted Raspberry. Um, part of the reason was simply that Raspberry, unable to own two teams in the league, seen as a bit of a conflict of interest. So, um, but when Minnie became the owner, she had worked within her uncle's ventures for a number of years, um, serving as a secretary treasurer for the team. Things, so she was well acquainted with many of the operations and how things worked on a daily basis. Um, and so she will serve in that role for the Detroit Stars uh, in 1956. And this is a picture um, shared with, to me by Carol Sheldon. Um, of many at one of the uh, many wonderful Negro League celebrations that the Detroit Tigers have held over the years. Many um, also had the honor of being invited to the White House with a number of other uh, Negro Leaguers to meet Barack Obama while he was president. Uh, many is the only uh, living owner of the Negro Leagues um, today and so uh, lives in Grand Rapids. Others that we could think about, and this just is to pique your interest a little bit because there are many, many more. But when we talk about owners and we talk about Effa Manley as essentially the first uh, or the most important, or we think about her as the actual honor of the first is Olivia Taylor with the Indianapolis ABCs pictured here, 1922 to 1924, when her husband CI passes away, she inherits the team. The manager of the team, of course, is CI's brother, Ben Taylor. By all accounts, they butted heads a great deal. Um, I don't think that Ben was particularly fond of having uh, uh, Olivia as the owner, not that he believed that she could run the team. Um, and ultimately, the struggles that she had lead to her to selling the team in 1924. But in addition, well, First of all, the first year that she owned the team, they came in second in the league. Um, but in addition to her work, much like Effa, um, both with the team, but also in the community, Olivia was a in, very involved member of the Indianapolis um, 
NAACP, rising to be president and using her work in the NAACP to actually bring the National Convention to the city of Indianapolis in 1927 and serve as the convention leader, uh, first female to ever do that. And so again, seeing this opportunity to take their positions and use those positions for the greater good of their communities. Um, and so a fairly common refrain. Um, Mentioned there on the bottom is Clara Jones, who serves as the president of the Boston ABCs uh, with manager Clem Mack, our owner Clem Mack, during the early 1930s. This is the team that some people know um, for pitcher Will Jackman, very, very well-known uh, semi-pro independent barnstorming club that played not only in the Boston area, but throughout Massachusetts. And she is listed as the president in 1933. Fortunately, we don't know a great deal more about her. Um, and so that's a story still um, to unfold in terms of her involvement with that team. Um, Ethel Truman Posey, of course, the wife of Cum Posey. Um, and with his passing, she and um, Helen Jackson will take on the ownership of the team uh, the Philadelphia team, um, well, the Pittsburgh team, sorry, for a short period of time. Um, and then you have Hilda Bolden Shorter, daughter of Ed Bolden, um, who will take over the running of the Philadelphia Stars with the passing of her father. Um, and uh, Hilda, in addition to taking on that role with the team, was also a pediatrician. Um, graduated from Meharry Medical College. She was also a classically trained pianist, uh, used her skills there in order to raise money for local hospitals and other uh, entities that could help the community. There's a great article that talks about her hosting a benefit concert when she went on her travels through Africa um, in order to benefit some hospitals there. She was a composer and singer. Um, and so, and later um, after she sells the baseball team, she continues obviously her work as pediatrician and became very no well known in the field of um, infant mortality and reasons for infant mortality with a number of interesting articles published um, on that topic. Um, Henry Ann Green, of course, um, inherits the Baltimore Elite Giants from her husband, Vernon, when he passes away um, at the very end of the 1940s. Um, and Green will keep that team for a little over a year um, before selling it to Richard Powell. And then the picture in the middle is Gertrude Willis Geddes, associated uh, with the city of New Orleans, better known outside of the baseball world for the funeral parlors and funeral homes that she owned and the sort of empire she built, uh, which is still present today and her name is still attached to those funeral homes. Um, but she served in the 1930s as a treasurer for the New Orleans Black Pelicans, a name, a team that some of you recognize um, for Tony Stone's involvement with the New Orleans Black Pelicans. And so Gertrude Willis Geddes, um, very accomplished in her own right and served to help and use some of her skills with the New Orleans Black Pelicans. And as I say, there are many, many others that could be uh, mentioned here, but these are just a few to expand our horizons beyond just Effa Manley and maybe Olivia Taylor to some. Um, these are a few of the others that you could put into that picture. When we think about the players, we mentioned some of the earlier players, but here are the three most well-known to everybody. Tony Stone, Mamie Johnson, and Connie Morgan playing in the 1950s. Connie Morgan, of course, um, a basketball player as well, well-known in the Philadelphia area for her skills in basketball and also playing in on local Philadelphia teams, the Honey Drippers, things of that sort. So, um, well known for her athletic skills before she joins uh, the Indianapolis Clowns. Uh, Mamie Johnson becomes a pitcher for the Indianapolis Clowns, uh, having played baseball all her life in the uh, New Jersey and Washington, D.C. areas. Went uh, 
to try out for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League in the early 1950s. And of course, was turned away, as she says later um, in a number of interviews that she gave. Um, she says later that that turned out to be the best thing that could have happened because it allowed her to pitch in the Negro Leagues and become first uh, professional female pitcher. Um, later on, of course, in 2014, she's going to have the opportunity to meet and uh, talk with Monet Davis after her victory in the Little League World Series. And so that's where a lot of people came to you know Mamie. Mamie um, was a nurse for many, many years and also owned a Negro Leagues memorabilia shop in the Washington, D.C. area. I had the opportunity to meet Mamie on a number of occasions and um, loved listening to the stories that Mamie would tell um, about her playing days and what it was like to travel and the excitement she felt just getting the chance to play baseball. And if you haven't seen it, um, the movie, the documentary film by Lauren Meyer, The Other Boys of Summer, has some nice interviews with uh, Mamie Johnson. And then Lauren um, shared some additional interviews with uh, Mamie that didn't make the cut in the documentary when she was the featured speaker at the Women's Baseball Conference in early September. And you can find um, and listen to her uh, talk on the Sabre website under the Sabre Archives YouTube channel. And so I encourage you if you want to hear more, particularly um, hear it in Mamie's own words, because that's what Mamie will provide there and tell you some stories. Um, and then, of course, the third pictured here is Tony Stone or Marcenia Alberga. Um, tomboy took on the name Tony in order to make it a little easier to play um, from the St. Paul, Minneapolis area. Field named in her honor there went on to play not only in the, the, her hometown area, but went out to San Francisco and played. Um, in San Francisco, and then finds her way to New Orleans, playing in New Orleans um, for a couple of different teams before she ends up in the Negro Leagues with both the Indianapolis Clowns and the Kansas City Monarchs. And so um, Tony had an opportunity to play for a couple of seasons with the two teams and hit 243 reportedly and um, was elected to the all-star team in one of those seasons. And so um, the question that's often asked about these three ladies um, was, was it just for publicity? Was it just an opportunity to try to increase attendance at Negro League games because of integration and um, Robinson having moved forward and declining attendance for Negro League games. All three of them discuss this in various interviews um, to different levels, as do others who basically say, well, that might have been a motivation. And certainly if you're a businessman, that's always a consideration, but they had the skill level necessary to be able to play um, because the team still wanted to win. It wasn't like they weren't looking to win. And so they weren't gonna put somebody in there that was going to cause them to lose. And so Tony, Connie and Mamie, are the three who play in the 1950s. Um, now, if you backtrack just a little bit into the 1940s, I mentioned a connection with Tony Stone to New Orleans. Um, we also know in New Orleans that in 1948, um, Alan Page, who was in, very involved in the baseball scene in New Orleans, owned the Page Hotel where a lot of the teams and players stayed, teams that traveled through the area, um, actually hired two young ladies in 1948 to be associated with the New Orleans Creoles, uh, Fabiola Wilson and Lucille Diamond, um, both of them serving as both players and coaches. Uh, Fabiola Wilson and Lucille Diamond were both college educated, um, graduating from Xavier University in the case of Fabiola Wilson. Um, and so they're listed in a number of articles as both pinch hitters and third base coaches on the field. And uh, when you read more about Fabiola Wilson, she goes on um, after her ball playing career to move out to the Seattle area, uh, marries a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Woods, has eight children, got very involved in the Seattle area, um, black community, well known for, like others, her civic engagement and involvement, um, member of the Immaculate Conception Church, 
highly involved in all of their activities in the community um, and died in 2002, so not all that long ago. Um, and so again, names that we don't hear a great deal about or know much, and you can add others. Um, you have Desiree Robinson um, playing in the 1950s, coming on along with these three ladies. So there are other names that need to be added to this picture. Um, backtracking just a little bit, here's a newspaper article talking about uh, the uh, play of Isabel Baxter playing for the Cleveland Giants in 1933. And you can see here it says, featured in the opening game of the season at Hooper Field in Cleveland, the Giants easily trounced the strong Canton Clowns, 14 to eight. Miss Baxter took five fielding chances, her only bobble coming when after a spectacular stop back at first base, she pulled Tom Ponder off the bag. So um, Cleveland Giants, of course, later in 33, become a member of the Negro Leagues officially, but at this point they were a um, independent barnstorming team. And so when they actually enter the league, her name does not appear on any, at least yet, that we have found. So she's playing with them early in 33. Um, East-West Classic, this is just a program to show you again the emphasis on, on women and using them to advertise um, the two teams. And so this is just an advertisement. Um, the young lady that you see there in the center is from a much more recent uh, tournament, the national tournament supported by Baseball for All, held um, in a variety of places, but most recently in Rockford, Illinois. This is a team um, from Roxbury, Massachusetts. And this is the Detroit uh, women's baseball team, independent traveling team, um, the Detroit Danger, and one of their players, Kenya McFall Moore. You can see her there in the front row wearing, um, in the second to second in on the front row teammate. And again, this uh, photograph provided by Carol Sheldon uh, to bring attention to the play of one of her teammates um, in the last 10 years. Uh, the Detroit team is no longer playing, uh, but were a traveling team playing teams both in Michigan and mostly uh, Michigan and Illinois. Uh, two, three others that should be mentioned as we think about this. We have here Tam Tamara Holmes, Malika Underwood, and Charlotte Wiley. Holmes and Underwood um, their baseball career most closely associated with the U.S. national team, the Women's World Cup, um, playing on the team since 2006. Um, tournament played every other year, but they also played in the Panama Games um, and a number of other international tournaments with both Holmes and Underwood often leading the teams um, in both fielding and in hitting. Underwood um, playing in the infield, Holmes generally playing at first base. Um, and then Holmes also played for the Colorado Silver Bullets in the late 90s, along as did Charlotte Wiley. Charlotte Wiley um, played for the Colorado Bullets for one season um, as a pitcher, and Holmes was with them in 96 and 97. Colorado Bullets, of course, playing from 1994 to 1997. Um, expanding the picture just a little, again, as I said, beyond the baseball diamond, when we look at baseball today, these are just a couple of examples of where we see. So we think of Claire Smith, uh, the fabulous and f infamous and famous um, reporter for ESPN, a number of other places, the J.G. Taylor Spinks Award winner. Well, here is Shakia Taylor on the far left. Shakia is a current baseball writer, writes about the history of black baseball, a variety of other topics. She most recently just um, moderated a panel um, on the Negro Leagues for the Chicago White Sox. Um, picture in the center is Elaine Weddington Stewart, first assistant GM for the Boston Red Sox, starting in her career with the Red Sox in the late 1980s, um, and was the first woman, black or white, to hold that position, and is still involved in baseball today. Um, and then the picture on the far right is Lonnie Murray, the only female African-American licensed by Major League Baseball as an agent and has been working with players for almost 20 years. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You could mention um, 
Maka Scott, who works as counsel for the Chicago White Sox, Jakara Ware, who works in marketing for the Arizona Diamondbacks, Nicole Whiteman, who works for the Los Angeles Dodgers, and the list goes on. And so simply an opportunity to show you that the picture of the participation of black women in baseball is much deeper and broader than most of us think. It goes back into the 1880s, comes right up to the present day. And while we tend to focus on the women in the Negro Leagues, um, even there, what we generally know is, again, just the tip of the iceberg. And so that's really what I wanted to show you today. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. And I am going to stop this recording and hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.